A UKIP poll found that 61% of people in the UK believe that Rishi Sunak was right to call the general election and just 11% uh, say that he was wrong. Is that the sense that you're getting in the UK? Do Brits tend to love a, a bold move? No, I just think it's that people are absolutely so sick of both politicians, both parties. Uh, they're, both, they're both empty. They gaslight. They don't deliver on their promises. S uh, Starmer doesn't even make promises. He just talks about, you know, uh, bold things like truth, beauty, justice, stability. He never says how he's going to do it. And a lot of people actually think that there's going to be a hung parliament where nobody can do anything. Well, I have to say, I've been saying there may be a hung parliament, but it's not going to be a well-hung parliament because none of these people have got you-know-whats. I mean, it's a terrible situation. <laughs> well, we'll wait and see what happens July the 4th. Let's move on to another quite serious topic now. The families of five female Israeli soldiers held by Hamas terrorists have released a graphic video showing their abduction. They call it a damning testament to the nation's failure to bring home the hostages. Now, the Hostages and Missing Families Forum released this footage and the five women were captured near the Israel-Gaza border during the attack on October 7. Roger, what impact will this have? Well, as I understand it, the worst parts of that video, which are really horrific, have been removed. People just couldn't stand it if they saw it. Mm. Um, and it, it is really shocking, and hopefully uh, it will bring the hostages to the attention of all the people who are demanding a ceasefire and the rest, because, I mean, how do you have a ceasefire with somebody who's destined to destroy you and said that if you stop fighting, you know, they do October 7th all over again? We um, have seen quite horrific pro-Palestine, anti-Israel protests playing out right around the world, right here in Australia as well. And the update on that is that the anti-Israel protesters occupying a major building at the University of Melbourne have finally ended their encampment after a week-long sit-in while demonstrators at the University of Sydney refused to leave. And these sit-ins are partly inspired by the chaotic scenes that we have seen in America. And, of course, if you need reminding of why some protesters felt the need to attend, well, let's just take a look. I honestly don't know okay. all of what NYU's doing. Is there something that NYU's doing? I really don't oh. know. I'm pretty sure they're... Do you know what NYU is doing? About what? About Israel. Why are we protesting here? I yeah. wish yeah. that was more educated. I'm not either. Oh. I, I, I came from Colombia. I was there all back in Colombia and we came down. They said NYU students needed our support. So I came down. I heard there's lots of cops. Some people were saying it was getting dangerous. Roger, what's your assessment of the protests that have been unfolding at Australian universities? I, I think it's terrible. I mean, these kids look like they're channeling uh, Woodstock and the Vietnam War protests. And of course, there are two different things. I mean, uh, people during the Vietnam War protests weren't embracing the Viet Cong and making them their heroes. They're just totally different. So these these poor kids are, are deluded. But I mean, I think that uh, the media in Australia, the, the mainstream media is really not being fair. The uh, reporting of uh, the incidents in Melbourne where, you know, I, they didn't even say that the six people arrested were all from the pro-Palestinian side, not the other side that was uh, protesting there. And I, I think it's just crazy. And these 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 kids are going to be very disappointed one day when they realize that they're turkeys for Christmas because, you know, after Israel comes all the rest of us. We're infidels, according to these Islamic uh, terrorists. Uh, everybody who is not their kind of Muslim should be, uh, you know, should be exterminated or whatever. And I'm very disappointed by Albo. I mean, you know, he won't condemn uh, the uh, the ICC arrest warrant for Bibi Netanyahu, uh, the press is reporting, because he doesn't want to lose the vote. Well, I mean, that seems to me really horribly cynical because there's what now? 800,000 Muslims in Australia? Mm. I can't believe that all of them feel this way just like the IRA was in, 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 in the UK and Ireland, this is a very small number of people. Uh, my Muslim friends in London are afraid to go out in the street because, you know, white British folk, they say, glare at them. 
So, you know, I don't think Albo really needed to do that. He could have condemned that that idiocy along with everybody else, like even poor old Joe Biden. I completely agree with you. I think he is wrong not to condemn the ICC. Look, uh, getting back to the protesters and who's really turning up to, to these demonstrations, as we just saw in that clip, uh, some people don't really know why they're getting swept up in it. And then we are seeing reports that others are getting paid to be there. What impact are the political agitators having on these demonstrations? Well, I think you've got three classes of people. You've got the political agitators who are certainly, according to sources like the French Interior Ministry, Russian agent provocateur, uh, who are coming over there and paying people and organizing anti-Semitic and anti-Israel marches so that the, the what we now call the axis of uh, the, the powers of Russia, China, Iran, Yemen, and North Korea can destroy Western values and, and Western supremacy. Um, so those are really hardcore agitators. Then you've got the people who are being paid who are the usual suspects who show up at these things and make a lot of trouble. And then you've got the masses of very innocent, well-meaning, pretty naive kids and grown-ups who, you know, who are fighting for Palestine uh, as they see it. And it's a, it's a, a huge part of it. Um, I, I think, Gabriel, is a function of social media and television, which we didn't have, for example, uh, when Britain was was bombing Dresden when they just, you know, blew the, the hell out of every building in Dresden, killed everybody, didn't care, you know, wanted revenge. Or even worse, can you imagine social media? Can you imagine X and Insta uh, uh, and television uh, reporting on Hiroshima, you know, where they flattened the place and millions of people? I mean, so these people are seeing this stuff for the first time and it's driving them crazy and out onto the streets. Uh, but they don't realize how they're being used as pawns, I feel. Mm. And, and what's it doing in terms of fueling anti-Semitism? I was speaking to a Jewish student just last night about his experience, the names that he's been called, the, the, how unsafe he feels as a university student. What's your assessment of it? Well, anti-Semitism has been around for a long time. Um, <clears throat> If you Google the words anti-Semitism timeline uh, in Google, you'll see that it goes back thousands and thousands of years. It's always it's always the same thing. Um, and a lot of this anti-Semitism has always been there. And it's just an opportunity for it to come out of the woodwork. It's a good excuse because people can now claim that they're anti-Zionist, but not anti-Jewish. But it's it's a very fine line. And if you look at the protests, I wasn't in Melbourne, but certainly in London, uh, you see swastikas, you see people yelling, you know, kill the Jews, uh, you know, all sorts of stuff, uh, while the police, just as uh, in Melbourne last week, I just kind of stand by and don't do very much. Mm. And what should universities be doing? Well, I mean, they should be cracking down. I, I think one thing about the universities is that what has been... There, there are two schools of thought here in the UK and in the US, which are there should be no protests, close them down like France and Germany did at the start. On the other hand, free speech exists, let them protest, but let them go somewhere like, like Regent's Park in London, where they can make all the noise they want, but they don't keep ordinary people from going to work and earning a living. I mean, there's reports every day in the news here about people who are, you know, they're gig industry workers or day workers who've lost a day's pay because they were blocked by stop oil or some other protest. Uh, so the good thing about the university is they're confined to the campus, and that makes it, that makes it somewhat better. Looking at what's unfolded in the past six months or so, where would you say we're at? Is there a deeper divide than there was, say, on October 6th? Uh, there's certainly a, a deep divide. Um, yeah, it's probably deeper in that I think that a lot of people, um, at least in the UK, are getting sick and tired of this, uh, having their lives disrupted every Saturday for seven yeah. months, um, listening to all this nasty uh, polemic 
uh, uh, demands from all sorts of high ranking, you know, good and great people for a ceasefire without an explanation of how do you have a ceasefire, you know, with somebody who's going to kill you the next day. Uh, and I think they're getting I think they're getting very, very tired of it. And the pressure is on on both parties, um, whoever, you know, is the next prime minister to do something about that and maybe stop them or move them to uh, a particular area where they can, you know, drive themselves crazy and have a ball. Look, finally, I want to speak to you about woke politics. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese plans to remove a government position from his cabinet. A source close to the Albanese government revealed to the Daily Mail that the role of Assistant Minister for the Republic would be dropped. Now, this move aims to distance him from woke propositions that might affect his re-election bid. What are your thoughts on this? Are we getting sick of woke politics now we're in 2024? Yeah, I mean, you could almost kind of conflate the protests with the woke politics to a certain degree. And I think we're all getting sick of that, too, because, you know, the woke woke politics, wokeism is essentially joyous, negative, judgmental, privileged, entitled, and most of all, victimhood uh, mm -hmm. on steroids. And I think people are getting tired of listening to this whinging and moaning. And, and at first they were made to feel guilty, but one can see that large corporations around the world are dumping all of their DEI and their ESG environment and you know governance, all these things that have nothing to do with their business, but which they feel made them more acceptable to the criticisms of, of the woke people who they thought might be their customers. And they're kind of realizing this is just a waste of time. So I do think that as these big companies disband these departments and these uh, programs and stop funding them, there won't be money for coaches. Uh, there won't be money for uh, symposia. Uh, and, there, and, and there'll hopefully be less money uh, for the agitators to pay people to go out and protest. Mm. Absolutely. Dr. Roger G. Welb, so brilliant to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us on Power Hour. Thank you.